Thank you. Uh, this talk is about uh, ESOS, which is a software that we started developing uh, 10 years ago now. And uh, we use uh, to collect data from uh, sensor uh, deployed in the fields. And uh, this title is because uh, I come up with this uh, paper on science. And it was very interesting because it was an analysis on how nowadays Earth observation data are uh, very much used. And uh, since uh, uh, these kind of data are available, the local monitoring system based on the in-situ sensors start to be put on the side because uh, there are several, uh, several uh, challenges and several benefits for using Earth observation systems, of course, no? And uh, this is true. In fact, the market is uh, very fast growing, new satellites. This is, uh, uh, is not really updated as a date, but gives you an idea of the number of satellite missions that uh, were sent uh, in, the, in the time from the 72 and the data that are collected. This type of data are very interesting because they are specially distributed, so you can have uh, data that cover uh, a large amount of area, uh, has a high coverage because generally these stations, uh, these uh, satellites uh, are rotating around the globe and collecting periodically uh, observations. And uh, one important thing is that they are maintained by external institutions. It means that you can use the data, but you don't have any uh, cost in uh, maintaining the system and all these kind of things. Uh, the drawback, let's say, is that the temporal and spatial resolution generally is low, because uh, even though you have high uh, resolution uh, satellite now, still you have a pixel of uh, meters on the soil. And uh, this is an indirect measures. The same paper at a certain point was also, also questioning if some observation from satellites are actually observation or, or are more a result of the models. Because uh, the treatment of the data before coming to the desired output is so complicated and so long that, uh, and have so much assumption and model inside that uh, is a question of if it is a direct observation or, or not. And uh, on the other side, in situ observation have some good points, and also here we have drawbacks. And the good points from the same papers is about fidelity, resolution, and consistency. We have uh, very often historical records, also more than 100 and 150 years, of the same observation in the same location. And this gives us a lot of information to extract trends and behavior and understand the phenomena in the long term. And uh, this, they generally are point one measurements, so you have a sensor in a location and collect the information, high, high temporal resolutions. And this permits, for example, to understand uh, uh, local uh, high variability phenomena and uh, also local phenomena. So, Instead of sampling at uh, higher resolution, if you are able to have a higher uh, sampling uh, frequency, you can detect more uh, precision, with more precision, the, the phenomena that you want to like. Uh, on the drawback, uh, there is a uh, low spatial resolution because it's high because you're collecting one point, but you cannot deploy 10,000 sensors in the fields to cover a large area. And the cost of maintenance and management at, uh, at a local scale is on, your, is on your shoulder. So it's not external. It's not an external cost. And uh, this, this paper makes a, a comparison of the cost. And they say it's very difficult to understand what is uh, the cost of maintaining a satellite system or uh, on monitoring networks. But more or less, uh, it come out with uh, one third of the cost uh, of having a satellite uh, uh, mission is uh, every year for maintaining monitoring network. Because also maintaining is, uh, is, uh, is a crucial task in the monitoring network because you can deploy your sensor, but if you don't take care of your sensor after a while, the data are uh, trash, basically. So in these days, there is uh, a lot of uh, push that uh, can help uh, in uh, 
sustaining uh, the development of uh, monitoring stations. And uh, this is mainly thanks to the IoT market, which is uh, quietly growing. There is a, a large number of projections of uh, the potential market in the future years. And uh, through the, because of this uh, great market, there is also a, a great push from the technological point of view to create new sensors and new devices at low cost, and also new communication uh, information. And uh, this, uh, at the end, uh, brings uh, to a new potential for deploying new monitoring networks, but having a lower cost somehow in, in the monitorings. And this is particularly true for uh, the second level networks. I named these the first level and second level, but who have an idea for uh, uh, weather station hydrological monitoring. We have uh, a federal monitoring networks which use a very high expensive station with very high precision. And their final goal is to uh, have uh, national issues like aviation forecasting, uh, weather, and major river management. So they have a certain goals. But then there are also the second level uh, monitoring network which is more problem specific. They require uh, less accuracy, for example, but uh, enough accuracy to solve uh, practical issues. So uh, we have, uh, for example, in our region, cantonal networks that use uh, uh, the resource activity. So, for example, to control the minimal flow in the rivers or uh, to give a water uh, a concession for drinking water abstraction and things like that. This is uh, how in uh, the region where we are located in southern part of Switzerland, close to Legedo, the monitoring network for the hydrometeorological uh, stations uh, evolved from uh, the 2000 to 2019. And you see that there is an increasing of number of stations. These uh, in blue are the, from the National Confederation monitoring station, and these are cantonal networks. And uh, this was non real time station. So the trend is uh, try to densify the networks to automate them, and then uh, through to integrate and create partnerships. Because anyway, any additional information, add, even if it is not of the same quality of the first level networks, they are still useful to densify and to create new informations. And uh, this plot, I found it very nice, is uh, from a study in, uh, on the hydrometric network in Switzerland. And you can see that uh, this uh, trend that I was uh, Telling at the beginning, there was an increasing on the number of stations deployed since around the 80s, the 70s, when the satellite starts, and then they arrive as stay stables. On the other side, from the 70s and the 80s, uh, there is a an incre huge increase of number of uh, uh, local stations from uh, second level networks. So this means uh, less precise because you have uh, less money at the local level, general, etc. But you have a lot of problems that you want to see to solve and densify, and also an increase of private networks, private sensors. So there is one issue in this story: is we want to densify, have new stations, but then how to guarantee the sharing of the of the information? With satellite, I would say it's quite easy. There is a satellite emission. They decided the format and they put on the platform, and this is shared with everybody. This is generally how it goes nowadays. But with in-situ observation, you have uh, a, a, num a huge number of different type of sensor, different type of format, different type of variables, and etc. And then the other thing is that uh, when you pay for your networks and you manage your networks, you are not incentivated to share this information because it is an additional cost for you and there is no, uh, no obligation to do this. So it's just a voluntary base to share this information. To try to overcome these issues, we in, uh, in 2010, we started to develop this uh, software based on the open standard uh, sensor observation services, which uh, uh, allows uh, to share in the standard format uh, data. This standard allows to collect data from a data producer point of view, so a uh, new sensor can be registered and can feed the data to the database, to the server. And then from the other side, there is uh, the cons data consumer that then can, can get the data with the standard uh, OGC protocol, uh, get capability, uh, and etc. 
This is based on XML and uh, standardized data access and the semantic representations. This is the software that we have implemented. It's a server-side application that have uh, a graphical user interface, mostly for administration it is, but still you can see different type of observation and you have uh, your stations, the location and the data, and you can edit, update, and do a lot of things. I, maybe I will put a, a bit of emphasis on, on the functionalities at the end, but uh, here I want to show how we have used this source in these years in different type of application, mainly locally on research project. We are from academy, we are a university, so uh, we have uh, used this software for a consultancy for the governments, but also in research project. And uh, there are also other applications in different countries that uh, I didn't include it here because uh, sometimes you don't even know or uh, you don't have uh, the application. The first application is about uh, an early warning system for like floodings in the Locarno area in the southern regions of uh, Ticino. We have uh, different type of informations that are contextual like the astral house and uh, uh, elements, sensible elements. And then we have observation of the lake levels and the river gauges. And, uh, we collect and process all this information through a web processing service that uh, pro produce hydrological model and forecast uh, based on the forecast uh, the future level of the lakes. And this is used on a uh, decision support uh, system by the civil, uh, <coughs> uh, civil authorities uh, to take actions and uh, to notify interventions and to manage uh, all the exposed things and take decisions and make planning. This is actually in production, so it's uh, more than uh, five, six years is running. We had also one flooding and they use successfully the system. And so the collection of real-time data is a very useful to uh, put in as a, a block in the chain. Another one was a project to landslide monitoring. Uh, the Polytechnics of Milan developed these new systems uh, for like a sort of geophone to call, detect uh, uh, early information on uh, possible slides. And uh, the system collected this information in sensor observation service and uh, delivered also alerts to the administration in case something is not. Another one is an FP7 project, which is named Enorasis, uh, whose aim uh, is, uh, was to develop a system that collects information from uh, agriculture, from fields, and uh, uh, based on also on weather forecast, uh, produce uh, a, an irrigation plan for the uh, next two days uh, to the farmers so that they can uh, save waters and maximize the, field, the yield. And also here, sensors were automatically sending data to SOS and then used in this uh, processing of this information to uh, predict the... Another one is in Horizon 2020, FreeVAT. This, uh, in this project, it also has been used as a data source for a number of information to uh, integrate this data within uh, QGIS. FreeVAT is a QGIS extension to run groundwater modeling, basically. And uh, it has provided a lot of information to calibrate your models, set uh, your models, and make predictions. Uh, this is uh, the first application and the motivation why we started to develop uh, this system is the management of the hydrometeorological uh, network for uh, the local administration, the Canton Ticino in Switzerland. Yeah. And uh, today the system is running and we have more than 700 sensor registered at the 50 years of data and uh, these are some of statistics of the systems. And uh, this is really working smoothly. Uh, Honestly, I have to say this, it's, it's very stable. Other projects we just come up uh, is in integrating uh, data, quality data from the lakes. So also biological data integrations and uh, sampling uh, from uh, automatic uh, buoy stations. And uh, in this application, uh, one experiment that we also deployed the ESO software, not only at the server side, but also in the sensor side, so directly on the buoy, and then the data were collected directly from the buoy that was serving. 
Another one is a recent application is about uh, with biologists uh, to try to monitoring uh, the, the habitat of uh, mosquito in the manhole because uh, there is uh, an issue in uh, Switzerland for tiger mosquito, which is uh, uh, disease uh, uh, risky, they, they bring diseases, and uh, they are moving uh, to, toward north. So far, we have expected that uh, it's not going uh, over the Alps because uh, it was too cold, but uh, uh, actually it seems that happens, and probably because there is, there is this uh, hot spot where temperature is higher than expected. And the previous studies was done for uh, using satellite length and temperature surveys. So we created this uh, sensor that uh, used, uh, <coughs> this is uh, the first type of sensor that we created that used uh, LoRa as a protocol for communications. And uh, we collect this data and we integrate the data from the LoRaWAN server to the ESOS so that we connect uh, also data from LoRa uh, networks. This one is a research uh, uh, for development projects that we have uh, and it's uh, on the way to finish at uh, the end of the year, with, uh, mainly with Sri Lanka and Pakistan, to deploy and create uh, very low cost and fully open uh, weather monitoring stations. It means they use uh, open hardware, use open standard, open software, and also open data. They automatically collect data from the fields. They uh, create a statistical report. They put on CCAN uh, for availability, and there is the server with fair data availability. And uh, uh, such kind of uh, <coughs> stations are very low cost, and uh, we deployed more than 30 stations in one uh, watershed in Sri Lanka so far. And I try to make an advertise because uh, we are applying in this uh, in the next month to a new opportunity to having uh, additional funds for uh, uh, fostering the uh, the impact of this project. And uh, we think we are thinking about to creating a trading the trainer program and create a sort of community. So if there is anybody of you know anybody from uh, low income country that would like to participate and. Uh, uh, we can go there and make some trainings, and then they will train the trainers uh, and expand the networks. So we are very happy. This is the link where you can find some information. So we have evolved. I go quickly <laughs> to the end. In this time, we have evolved uh, version one, two, three. We added a number of functionality. We support authentication authorization. We support uh, data aggregation uh, on, on the server side, so you can download directly the average, the maximum, and things like that. We support time zone. We have uh, natively a quality index for each observation. So it means that when you get an observation, you have associated an index that tells you what is the quality of this information. And then you can filter using all these information so to filters. We support uh, MQTT integration directly, so you can feed data in the SOS from MQTT files, or on the way back you feed the ESOS, and the ESOS will feed the MQTT. And uh, we support virtual procedures, which is a sort of uh, procedures uh, on, la, on the fly processing of data. And we are using it, as, for example, to convert data from uh, river height to river discharge, for example. We support JSON because uh, together with the standard, which is in XML, uh, we also have created uh, the RESTful API that uh, are compliant, let's say, with this XML, so use the same uh, feature and the same uh, 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 ontologies, and then, uh, of course, we have a graphical user interface. But what? We start to test and make some load testing, and we saw that uh, when we have uh, more than 1,000 concurrent, uh, concurrent versions, uh, we are out of personal performance. So we decided to change it, and we go with the renewal of some part of the code, and we change it, and we have started to develop ESOS 3, which have a great first-time results, because you see that with the number of increasing number of concurrent users, it's more stable. And this allows to address better the Internet of Things issues, because in the future, we will have more and more sensors, so more and more users concurrent for the server. 
But then at the Phosphor G Asia, this is December, last December, we meet and decided that this was just an improvement of the software, of the code, but was not uh, uh, canceling the limits. So we decided to rewrite completely the, the code, everything, and we started to develop ESOS MU, which is a, a microservices based, it's used GRPC, and uh, is a plan to be multi standard supporting. And so that is more scalable so on, uh, uh, on the cloud platforms. And that's all. We hope to, gi hope to give our small contribution in combating uh, climate changes. Thank you. Questions? That is awfully quiet. <laughs> now I'm sure you still have some. Yeah, I'll hold up. Okay, Chris, just go back to the previous slide and explain a bit more about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the one we're talking about, the ISOS new. ISOS? New. Yeah, okay, here. That one yeah. So we decided to uh, distinguish the different. Uh, object that we have in the sensor observations and to create a small uh, services for uh, each one. So we will have uh, services for the observation, one services for uh, feeding the location, one services for the observed properties and things like that. So that uh, depending on the needs, because there are two different types in the future of usage with IoT. Either you have sensor with very, very high frequency, so you have a lot of number of observation that you need to support, or maybe you have less frequent observation, but you have much more sensor. And this has a different impact on the database because you are acting on different objects. Making this a sort of separation allows to scale only the part that you really need to scale. And uh, this uh, should uh, cover in the future the capacity to uh, be high, have good uh, performance also under uh, high load conditions. And those colors are priorities. Priorities, the color. Oh. Ah, yes, uh, this is the priorities that we decide. This is the core part, and then there are other additional parts uh, like. Uh, Law, for example, we want to add also some modules for uh, uh, for the maintenance uh, because uh, in the Foronse project, uh, the one with the local uh, uh, low cost monitoring stations, uh, there was a, a big issue to call, to be able uh, to know how the maintenance is done because, uh, for example, if you have a station and you want to use the data. Knowing that the maintenance is correctly done is one of the first things that you want to know to understand the quality of the data that arrives. I think, last question. Uh, I think I have read it or maybe in presentation once that um, based on the received data, you are sending messages or alerts to the owners of uh, station or, or sensor. Um, how it uh, that is managed? It's uh, just uh, taking some minimum val values or value ranges, or it is collecting this. This this principle is collecting some set of set data series and then making decision when they are say, sending alerts. How that is organized? In the software, which is uh, let's say less uh, implemented with uh, lower uh, without graphical user interface we have implemented also uh, web uh, uh, notification service and a uh, web alert service so you can create your own script basically and you decide when there is uh, the need to send the alerts and then people can register to this uh, uh, event to this uh, to this uh, let's say processing and when is happening some things according to your scripts, uh, they will be informed, otherwise no. So for example, in this kind for, for the civil protection, there are uh, at the given height of the lakes, uh, there is information for certain type of uh, exposed elements uh, to be informed so they can be removed quickly before uh, the lakes goes up or things like that. Very, sh very short one. Uh, 
Uh, maybe you know, has anyone tried to use something from uh, machine learning or something such for prediction? Mm, yeah, the, the Albis project, for example. Uh, we collect information from the things, but then the, there is uh, a machine learning uh, algorithm that make the provision for the possibility of expansion of the species, of the tiger mosquito in different areas. Yeah. So it's more a, a, it's more a processing task. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Massimiliano. Thank you.